welcome Hoosier fans to a not so victorious and not so inspiring episode of the Assembly Call. At least not so inspiring game. Hopefully the uh, the show will will come out a little bit better than the uh, second half did for the Hoosiers. But tonight your Indiana Hoosiers lost on the road at Penn State, sixty four to forty nine, uh, in a game that uh, IU I thought really battled back and played well in the first half. Uh, left some points out there as Coach pointed out on the halftime show, but. At least went into the locker room tied, uh, didn't play well in spurts, but uh, but really showed some fight in the first half that turned out to be completely absent for the vast majority of the second half as IU got outscored 36-21 to after the break with a number of those uh, baskets coming late for IU. There was a stretch, I believe, over the first 20 possessions of the second half, IU scored three times. Uh, turnovers were a huge issue. Uh, a little bit in the first half, but in the second half, uh, IU turned it over 12 times uh, in 18 times in total for the game, of which I believe 15 of those were steals by Penn State that led to 21 points. And uh, you, you really need look no further than the disparity in points off of turnovers. That actually ended up being the final margin uh, of the game this evening. And uh, as much as uh, you know, probably the Maryland game and the Wisconsin game on the road, it was it was one of those kinds of efforts uh, in the second half for IU. It was really disappointing. Uh, the guard play w- was a big factor, which we'll talk about uh, as we move forward on the show, because the IU just did not get uh, a great deal out of the backcourt, uh, whether that be from a production or a, or a leadership standpoint. So uh, overall, a disappointing game for IU as they fall back to 5-5 five and five in the league. I'm your host, Andy Bottoms, here with the coach, Brian Tonsoni, and special guest co-host, Chad Schwartzkoff, a.k.a. Chat Mob Chad. And we'll break it all down for you on this edition of the Assembly Call IU Postgame Show. And let's start this show the way we start every show, and that is with our Hoosier Proud Banner Moment. Um, Obviously, the Banner Moment could not come from the second half, uh, so I'll go back to a stretch at the end of the first half where IU made a really nice run, got some solid play out of Deron Davis uh, during that stretch. You came back in the game with two fouls, managed to not only not pick up a second foul, but uh, really started a nice run to close the half. IU had struggled to score, uh, I think had a basket on maybe one basket in maybe nine or ten possessions. Duran hit a couple free throws uh, to start a stretch where IU scored 10 points over the last seven possessions uh, and had a, even a jumper from him um, from about 18 feet gave IU a two-point lead that they relinquished by giving up a tip in as the half closed out. But it was a really solid stretch of basketball for this team. Uh, Duran had those free throws, as I mentioned. Uh, Trace had a, a dunk on a, a, a lob that they had some success with in the first half. Armand hit a couple free throws. Trace had a putback, and, and Duran hit that jumper. And that was really... Uh, if you, I don't know what, you know, win percentages and win probability, all that stuff, but if you charted just general feelings about the game, uh, I think that's when IU fans were feeling the best. The rug would soon be pulled out from underneath them as they came out of the locker room in the second half. Uh, but I thought it was a really strong sequence of play by Duran. He was really, uh, really effective, really aggressive. Armand got to the free throw line by being aggressive and that aggressiveness, uh, that, that defined that stretch for IU is what really went away in the second half where Penn State was absolutely the aggressor, uh, really took it to IU. Um, I'll maybe if I can swallow it, uh, read through some of their possession log because it was just a parade either to the free throw line or to the bucket uh, in the second half. But that stretch at the end of the first half, uh, to me, was a Hoosier Proud banner moment for IU tonight. Our banner moment tonight, as always, is brought to you by our friends at Home Field Apparel, uh, a company that was founded by an IU grad and remains based in Indianapolis. They have 60-plus different schools available on their website in case you're looking to buy something other than IU gear after this performance. But IU was their first school, and they remain huge supporters of IU athletics. Uh, I think Coach has the uh, Bison hoodie on tonight. I know uh, that I have purchased – we've purchased a couple of the shirts they released over the course of the football season uh, with different logos from uh, from some of those eras. So I I purchased the one back from the – Bill Mallory era when uh, my family and I started going to games. They brought back the oval. They've got long sleeve tees as well. Uh, Jared, as best I can tell, is now living in his uh, long, sleeve, long sleeve script IU t-shirt. Uh, and uh, as we plan for the meetup, I'm uh, definitely afraid that uh, I will end up you know, wearing one of the same shirts as Jared and or Ryan uh, during that stretch because we've all bought so much from home field. Uh, but again, uh, really comfortable shirts, the assembly call sweatshirt uh, that Jared uh, sent to me for Christmas, just incredibly soft and comfortable. Uh, and, uh, and the, the logos, as I mentioned, are ones that you can't find anywhere else. They do such a good job of going back into the archives, not only for IU, but for other schools as well uh, to get logos that you can't find anywhere else. Uh, 
And because you're a member of the Assembly Call audience, you get a massive discount when you order at homefieldapparel.com. You can use the promo code ASSEMBLY20 at checkout to get 20% off your entire order. That's ASSEMBLY20 for 20% off your entire order. So go to homefieldapparel.com today and get the most unique and comfortable IU apparel anywhere. All right, now it's time to move the ball, find the open man, and get some opening thoughts from the rest of our team. Uh, Coach, I'll throw it to you first. You had uh, a lot of positive things to say uh, on the halftime report. I assume the tone of your comments uh, here will be uh, will be much different if if for no other reason than you asked if we had a chance to set the record for the shortest post game show ever before we came on. So uh, I'm right there with you. I think many many people want to relive parts of this game as little as possible. But uh, what what are your thoughts on tonight's game overall? Well, the, the game of basketball is the guards game. And, and when your guards don't perform, you're going to struggle offensively. And Indiana guards were awful. They were awful. They were really, really good against Michigan State. They were really, really good against Maryland. Tonight, the guards were awful. They were um, three for 26 from the field. They had seven turnovers. They didn't guard. You're not going to win college basketball games when your guards are bad. That's it. <laughs> All right, you're keeping up your uh, keeping up your end of the bargain. If we are in fact going to make this the uh, the shortest one, but yeah, that's true. We'll, we'll get into those guys more. But that was a really big uh, a really big theme, really big struggle for tonight. Uh, Chad, what about you? Uh, what uh, what kind of uplifting thoughts can you provide us with following that performance? Yeah, I'm sorry. I don't can't that's a, get. That's a big burden to put on you. That uh, that was unfair. I'm sorry. From this one. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, I mean, I always try to go into games and 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 uh, before the game, I tweet out, try to think of two words that IU needs to to think about. And for this game, I I, I said continue and attack. Continue the way the offense was playing, um, how we were getting a little bit better. Uh, we didn't do that. Uh, we started to maybe a little bit in the, in the first half. Uh, we saw at least some good decision-making, some good plays, some good inside-out play. Uh, maybe not necessarily out, uh, as our guards weren't hitting anything. Uh, and then attacking. And um, we showed that, as, as you said, in the banner moment by uh, getting aggressive at the end of the, the first half and being able to get back into it. But that's we totally lost that in the second half and, and could not find ways to get underneath. And, um, yeah, just like coach said, uh, an abysmal, uh, front court tonight and, and just, uh, something that hopefully they can put behind them and we can move on from here. The toughest, the toughest thing is as well is, you know, they're going to be tough nights offensively and guards are going to be struggle and players are going to struggle. They're not intending to struggle. The players aren't going out there purposely trying to play bad. The disappointing part started about the 10 or 11 minute mark when it just looked like the effort stopped. In the first half, it was ugly basketball, but the effort was there. I thought they were really competing defensively. They fought back at the end of the first half and made it a a tie ball game and gave everyone some hope. And this team has had situations where one end of the court does affect the other end of the court. And, and that is just frustrating. And that's, that's a mental aspect. And, and yes, it is uh, the responsibility of everyone in the program to try to le- even that out and level that out. But players who have a tendency to go up and down with their approach will revert back to the lower level of their training or the lower level of their toughness sometimes when things get tough. Playing at home playing in a warm environment in a regular situation, a lot less likely to happen when you get on the road and face adversity, a softness sometimes can appear. And that's the disappointing thing from my point, my point is at about the 10 minute mark when it got to be seven or eight, it just seemed like uh, the fight left this team. And, And that's just, that's just not acceptable. And yes, everyone in the program is responsible for that. Uh, but if you wear a jersey, uh, you play to the final seconds, uh, regardless of how you're shooting or how you're turning the ball over. And, and I didn't feel the Hoosiers did that tonight. And that, that's reminiscent of Maryland and the Wisconsin and the Northwestern game to some extent. And this team has it in them. Um, and, and, when, and when the coaching staff and when the players find the inner strength to get it out of them, Indiana plays well. And I will say they've done that more than not, 15 and 6. 15 times they've been able to overcome their natural tendency to not play hard and not be as, you know, to play casual and overcome those things six times they haven't. And when they haven't, most of those losses have been bad. Yeah. That, that stretch that you talked about, I, again, I didn't put timestamps on these, but I've been trying to, to do a better job of charting 
possessions and different things like that. So right about ha- at least halfway from a, a possession standpoint through the half, IU had only given up through the first 18 possessions for Penn State. They'd given up 13 points, and they were down by, I believe, six at that point. So as bad as IU had played at the beginning of the half, and there's a, a, a meaningful moment that we'll get to that came shortly before this stretch. But here's the next series of possessions from Penn State. Got to the free throw line, only made one. Dunk, layup. Put back off of a missed shot. They did they missed a three, so there was the first possession in the stretch where they didn't score. Layup, free throw line again, free throw line again, free throw line again. Missed a jumper. Then they made the wide open three at the end. Dunk. Stevens drive to the basket. Turned it over at one point. Another drive to the basket. Although Curtis Jones traveled on that drive to the basket, but I mean, there, none of those shots were were more. Uh, the three that they made was wide open. Uh, but otherwise, they hardly even took shots that weren't right by the rim, and they were parading to the foul line, which is one area that when you look statistically at this game, Penn State came in 13th or 14th in league play and defensive free throw rate, and IU really struggled to get there, really struggled to get the ball inside. But, yeah, I mean, I saw what you saw. T- to me, it was the offense wasn't working. The offense had been just straight up terrible um, to that point, but they had managed to stay in the game, which was a little bit in some ways like the first half where you hung around – uh, in, in some ways, in spite of yourself, and and then just basically packed it in toward the end, and it was just a straight line drive to the basket after straight line drive to the basket, and then on the other end, just the first shot that they could get would uh, w- would throw it up there. And I do think, to your point, there's you know a lot of comments been made on mental toughness and all those kinds of things. At, at some point, leadership has to come up, and and when the two captains on this team perform the way that they did tonight. I thought Devante was, I I struggle to believe no matter what, there's obviously the argument to be made that uh, you need Devante at times to be able to do this because they can't create their own shots. I I, I have no idea tonight what Archie thought he was going to get by continuing to run him out there and how that outweighed the potential benefit of what you could get from Armand Franklin, if nothing else from an experience standpoint. Um, that that's really where I struggled. I thought Devontae was really throughout selfish with the shot selection, careless with the ball, casual with the ball, um, and, and at some point to continue running him out there, you know, you get what you tolerate, all those kinds of things. This team certainly doesn't have a lot of options to turn to at guard, but I really struggled with during that stretch watching some of that play. How you continue to uh, sit there and watch that? Well, I, I struggled I to continue to sit yeah. here and watch it. So yeah, I. I- <laughs> I get that, um, but there were nine scholarship players available tonight. Um, you have Finnessy, who obviously is battling injury. When, when the game gets out of hand, um, you know, uh, are you going to put Finnessy back in because Green made a turnover? Um, at some point, you just leave Green out there and say, okay, you want to play the way you want to play? play play I mean because we're we're not going to win with you out there we're not going to win with you on the bench and we're going to get our best player injured um I I do understand I would say Franklin playing a little bit more more minutes and and I will address this and I know people disagree with me on this but you're not going to play the walk-ons because if you're mad at the kids for quitting the coach can't can't quit it um and, and people tend to forget that because we had Bob Knight who did that in the famous game and everyone loves all that but you you uh, a good coach coaches until the buzzer is, is done um, and Archie was standing up and coaching, and I don't know if he's a good coach or not. I don't even want to get into that, and the chat mob's probably going to vilify me for that. But but Archie was still standing up, and, and it's hard to coach when your team is down like that. <laughs> um, but if you just sub out everyone and play that with five minutes to go and it's an eight, nine-point game, that's quitting on a team. That's not good either in my book. So, um, you know, I, I do agree. I'm frustrated with Devontae's play. I do think he needs to play less. Um, it got to a point though, when you're down eight or nine, you, you hope to shake the pop bottle up and go on a wild streak with him hitting three threes and getting you back in there. Um, you know, it's probably not going to happen. So there's a lot of consideration that goes into it other than bad play sit, um, as a, as the ultimatum of, of a coaching staff. So I just ask people to think about that. There are different situations and different thought philosophies going in and and everyone's playing bad. There wasn't a guard on the roster that was worth a darn tonight. And I like Rob, and I like uh, Franklin, uh, and L, L plays hard and practice hard. None of them played well. So you can't play five centers. Well, I think it was it was it was at least a chance for it. I think Armand towards the end there, we saw a little bit of a flash when he got in there. He took that drive almost coast to coast, got fouled. He has moments in a few games, and he showed before 
uh, where when, when things are down and at the end, he can try to be that spark to get in there. And maybe coach needed to go that sooner or Armand with a little more confidence as he gets older within the team, he'll be, he'll be more uh, confident to get in there and try to make those runs uh, uh, sooner for the team. But I, I, th- I agree with you there that um, it, it, it's a toss up. Do you put Armand in the inexperienced freshman to try to see if he's going to spark or do you test the waters with Devontae and see if he can get a little hot hand at the end and maybe, maybe bring you back into it. Yeah, I think with with Armand, what I like about him is that at least he's making he's going to make mistakes, but he's making mistakes trying to get downhill. He actually drew fouls a little bit better than some of the other guys did. That to me, it was his mistakes were less out of being too casual with it and maybe more being too aggressive. But that's kind of I mean, to Coach's point, if you were if you were looking for five guys who were playing well to put out there, you weren't finding them uh, in, in this one tonight for IU. Um, coach, the other thing I wanted to kind of get your your thoughts on were or was IU really struggled to get the ball inside in the second half, um, largely because they were too busy turning it over, but in part because um, they really struggled to get to Trace. I mean, there were times he's catching the ball 25 feet from the basket uh, out there. Do you see anything different that Penn State was doing schematically to, to try to avoid touches for him? Because I thought they did a decent job of getting the ball inside in the first half. Um, but that was really non-existent in the second half. Um, anybody who watched the broadcast got to hear Seth Davis mention that approximately uh, 715 times. You know, so- sometimes the other team does a good job too. Um, and it's not uh, – Penn State's a really good defensive team. They're long, they're lengthy, they put a lot of ball pressure on, on the wings, and it is hard to throw the ball inside when you're being hounded. Uh, when you have to fight for every catch on the wing, we saw a couple of those go full, you know, for the pick sixes. Um, it, it was a grind-out game, um, and, and, you have, and that's, that's, Andy, where you need to be mentally tough. And, and if, if when adversity hits, you're not mentally tough, then you don't look into the post, or then you don't feel confident getting in there. At Sometimes you've got to force that ball in there. You've got to shot fake and do all those things, and no matter how tough the defense is, you've got to get it in there. I think Penn State just elevated their, their play. I thought they had a good strategy, too. They tried to get um, Indiana in foul trouble. Brunk struggled tonight. Um, you know, Trace Jackson Davis had a great first half, but a struggle in, in the second half. I thought Deron Davis played well. Um, but, yeah, I, I, I will credit it. Um, I, I don't I, – I mean, it's 50-50. I think IU's guards uh, didn't execute the offense. They weren't sharp. They weren't cutting with purpose. Um, you know, I, I showed a little clip on the, on the thing I put in the community today where uh, when you're attacking the defense and the defense is in rotation, then post feeds become easier. Well, it's pretty easy when everyone's standing uh, to guard the post and to discourage passes into the post. So it was a lack of execution combined with Penn State's excellent ability to guard that made it difficult, in my opinion, uh, to get the ball into the post. Well, I think it's one of those where I, I agree with you that Penn State did come out with a different level of, of intensity. And and I thought they were, again, really the aggressor on both sides. I thought they got IU's bigs in foul trouble by really going hard. I mean, even the beginning of the half, they threw it into that Hera or, or Hannah, whatever his name was, and really – just let him try to, you know, bang into Brunk a couple times, see what would happen. Watkins, that was one of the better games I've seen Watkins play in his Penn State career, um, despite the fact that he he feels like a guy that you see that has a ton of talent. Uh, and they were really the aggressor on both sides, pushed IU out of there. And, and when IU really struggles offensively, one, they get stagnant from a movement standpoint, and two, they're real quick to take the bait from the other team of – of jacking open shots and uh, and making those kinds of decisions. But, uh, Chad, anything else you, you saw from a – whether it be scheme standpoint or, or just differences from first half to second half that really helped to undo IU? I think I think it was right off the bat. I think uh, Penn State had a great game plan of, of going after our bigs and getting them into foul trouble. Uh, Brunk is our, is our toughness barometer. He's the one that really kind of sets the toughness tone for us. And uh, they threw him off his game and, and put him on the bench and caused it uh, uh, us to lose that kind of uh, uh, awareness for us and, and uh, a guy that could be in there and kind of spark something for us. It took him out of the game, and, and then therefore it took the toughness of IU's team out. Chad, that's an excellent point. Um, Brunk and TJD are, are the lifeblood of this team. And, and Archie said that way back in the summer when he was at Evansville. We have to be an old man game. You have to go inside. So that's a, that's an excellent point. And when you hit hit Indiana where they're strong, 
and, and then it forces reliance on, on other people, uh, you have a 50-50 coin flip, and, and coin came up tails today if you called heads. It, it just didn't work for, for IU uh, today where it had worked uh, in, in some previous uh, games. But I think that's a great point about their strategy, Chad, at the, at the beginning of the game. Well, and I think IU responded to that by Brunk in particular. I felt like he was so worried about picking up another foul that he was so passive defensively and really just kind of backed off as as they banged into him, um, which, you know, given some of the officiating tonight, I, you, you don't really know who was going to get called for what. That certainly wasn't the difference in the game, but it was um, odd, I guess, to say the least. But, yeah, he really seemed to get tentative, trying not to get that other foul to take him out of the game. But at that point, he kind of negated his effectiveness by by being that way and uh yeah this was definitely one of the bigger struggles that he had he did get a couple buckets late but uh in general was not one of uh not one of his better games well at Uh, least in a way it it at least got davis in there and kind of sparked our uh offense for the first half that was i mean i guess that was the only coin flip uh positive side to that because davis got a little bit more minutes and he was able to uh, be a deciding factor, I think, towards the end of that first half. Yeah, he did. Duran did respond really well. That was, uh, I mean, I mentioned, I mentioned in the banner moment, but that was one of uh, one of few bright spots. Uh, but uh, coming up, we're going to continue our breakdown of IU's sixty-four to forty-nine loss at Penn State. We'll point out today's meaningful moment you might have missed, and then go inside the numbers to highlight the most important statistical notes from the game. If you're listening to the assembly call, stick with us. This is Jordan Halls, and I never miss a shot, or an episode of The Assembly Call. Thanks, Jordan. You're listening to The Assembly Call IU Post Game Show. I'm Andy Bottoms, here with the coach Brian Tonsoni and chat mob Chad Schwartzkopf, and we are breaking down IU's 64-49 to loss at Penn State. Uh, I feel like whenever I host the show, I use that intro with holes in it so I can think longingly about having someone who could shoot the ball as well as he could, but... Here we are. Um, makes me wistful for uh, the, the days of Jordan Hulls. But uh, so it, it's time now to talk about a uh, meaningful moment that you might have missed. Um, there are very few parts of this game that that many people would like to relive, but there was one that was a turning point. Uh, I felt like in the second half, I believe the score was thirty six to thirty two at the time. Uh, it was. Uh, not too many possessions, about 10 possessions into the second half. Uh, IU had not come out well, but uh, Al had gotten to the free throw line a couple possessions earlier, and IU had the ball in a break after a missed three. And Devontae threw a kind of scoop lob to, I don't even know if it was Justin or Trace, because I think I became blinded with rage at the moment that the pass was released. Uh, but one of those guys, so turns out, you know, the ball turns over, it wasn't a good pass, uh, just not a smart, not a smart play. Um, Penn State goes down the other end, hits a three, and just a huge five-point swing there. I believe IU took a timeout uh, after that. Just a, a, a really, a really critical point where a bucket, e- even a two pointer gets you back within two and you feel like you've kind of stemmed the tide of, of not starting the half very well. And who knows what happens from there. Instead, you really let what, what there was of a crowd get into the game. Um, you let the lead get blown up to seven points. It would soon become double digits. And, and that was really around the point that once it got to double digits that, that coach talked about, um, where, where I, you really seem to kind of pack it in, uh, from that standpoint. So that to me was, was a turning point in the second half of, of something that they, they really could have done. I thought it was emblematic in, in so many ways of just, I use casualness with the ball. Uh, a lot of turnovers, just trying to make simple passes to the wing that got intercepted and, uh, and, and taken to the other end for a layup at one, the beginning of the second half where Rob just ran into Justin and dribbled the ball out of bounds. Uh, Devonte had a few entry passes that were, uh, that were not great. Just, just again, just casual play with the ball in situations where the other team really ratcheted up their intensity and IU seemed to ratchet its intensity down uh, somehow. I don't know really of a great lead in because I feel like we've touched <laughs> touched on a number of these points. But uh, coach, I, whether you want to comment on that moment or just the general kind of casualness with the ball, I'll take that whichever direction you want to. Yeah, you know, it's I, I just I said it earlier. Um when you coach young men in the game of basketball, there, there's a certain level of, of you try to train them to a level where when, when tough situations 
happen. Um, they default back to a, to a level that's acceptable. Uh, but you're you're all, you're dealing with not just what you do in practice and inside your program. You're dealing with who that person is and that personality. And and I'm not saying that anyone on Indiana's team is a bad person or has a bad. But there there is uh, a competitiveness. And in a week where we lost one of the greatest competitors ever uh, in Kobe Bryant and the Mamba mentality, it is amazing to me that young people in lots of walks of life. I'm an educator and in the classroom. Uh, don't have a desire to to do the best that they can as many times and as, as often as possible. Um, and and the, the casual play, the lack of attention to detail, is really hard to coach out of someone. Um, and you need to. And, and, yes, Archie is responsible for doing that. But I, I'm just being honest to all the listeners. It is the hardest thing I've had to do as a coach is to ca- coach casualness and a lack of toughness out of certain players. Um, And and sometimes it's not just what happened from Sunday to Wednesday, uh, getting the job done in practice before you fly to Happy Valley. It it takes sometimes years, if not (laughs) whatever, to to get someone to be at their maximum toughness, and you got to draw it out of their inner being. And it's just hard. Um, And at times it just comes back. And, and, And as a coach, you can't really do a whole lot about it, And except you try to find... Like people like hope, hopefully Trey Galloway, who will dive on the floor and eat paint and do everything that you need to do, and you just get eight or nine of those guys. Um, and, and again, but it takes time to fill a roster with those with those butt kickers. Um, so that that's that point. Um, and and uh, you know, it's it's just more difficult than you, than than just simply wishing someone would would not be casual. But boy, that play and that's Andy where. Even go back to the first half, the casual play in the first half that led to two pick sixes for four points, the opening tip, not fighting for that, and then a couple loose balls that got kicked out, one for a three, one for a two. There's about 11 or 12 points in just those plays alone, let alone the time that that they didn't play hard at the last 10 minutes. So um, those are the games within the game. I mean, what strange, meaningful moment. Strange, meaningful moment might be to try to take away from this uh, that – that's weird to say we've now had all three of our big men uh, show that they have a decent mid range game. So we've heard that they've uh, uh, been practicing that in the, uh, in in, in the practices a little bit. Um, And so I think, what was it? The Ohio state game where we had trace and Joey both kind of hit uh, mid range shots. And now uh, Duran kind of jumps in there as well. And uh, Ryan, I guess would be happy at least with his form, his shot looked good. So maybe we need to continue to practice that. And that's where we'll find some mid range game for this team. Well, I find somebody to space the floor. No. And Chad, you you bring up another great point here. Um, We can nitpick the guards were bad and then say that, you know, Archie needs to be held accountable for not developing the guards. Well, who thought Trace Jackson Davis was going to lead this team in points and rebounds? Who thought Joey Brunk was going to come in and do what he's doing? And look what he's getting out of Duran Davis. So, be critical of Archie and where he needs to be and maybe roster construction and taking timeouts and doing those things. Those are up for criticism. But if we're going to sit here and say the guard play is Archie's responsibility, but the post play is just the post players playing well, despite Archie, I just think that's unfair. And that's a little bit of the anger coming out as a coach because it gets old having people sit up in the stands who aren't in a fight, um, at least trying to understand uh, what, what's going on. Um, you know, so there's some good and some bad in this in in, in tonight's game. Smith um, Smith had 13 points and six of eight, but he didn't play super well. Trace Jackson Davis had 14. Uh, Brunk has played well, and and Deron Davis played really well. So, you know, that's all I'm asking for is is fairness in the evaluation and fairness in the fact that when we beat Michigan State, everyone's happy, and when when you lose to Penn State on the road, which is really tough in the Big Ten, it's automatically, um, you know, uh, get rid of everyone, and, and the sky is falling, but we're 15 and 6, you're a 7, 8, 9 seed in a bracketology, and you're not going to go away from that, because everyone on the bubble is awful, um, <laughs> unless you lose 19, the rest of the games, um, and I know last year's, so it's possible. <laughs> um, so, take a deep breath. Um this team battled for a half and then came back to some of its old things. And there's a, there's a hole in the dam. We got to plug it and move on. And you don't want coaches to quit. You don't want players to quit. It was a bad night. It was bad offense, bad coaching, bad defense. Uh, let's go move on. 
I'm, I'm amazed there, uh, Coach, that you uh, forgot about your best buddy when you're giving Archie the credit for uh, coaching the bigs. Your your best bud is there on the bench, and uh, Mike Roberts. Uh, so he he's been well, on the spot. Maybe he's helping him. Yeah, I mean, and, and I just I know I bring a perspective. And he probably gets old a little bit too, and um, you know that those locker rooms hurt on, on games like this. And 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 if you have a bad game as a coach, you hurt as well. If you made bad calls and and, and did things, but. You know, Indiana scored 76 points on Sunday, and their offense was great um, other than the last minute of, minute of play. So, you know, it, programs lose because coaches were bad and programs lose because players were bad, but it doesn't mean that uh, the, the sky is falling every time Every time there's a loss. Penn State played better than Indiana tonight, and um, and that, that's that's the truth. Yeah, I thought one, one of the other things, and we haven't touched on this this too much, was we, we talked a little bit about the foul trouble, but that was magnified by the fact that Race was unavailable again, uh, and Jerome was seemed like he was ill. I think they released a statement around halftime that he was ill and wasn't going to play, and uh, I know a couple of the, the folks who were there said he was in and out of the locker room uh, in the first half. And uh, as you, you don't want to play with that condition. No. <laughs> no. Uh, everyone can that's really crappy. That's yeah, really there, crappy. There, oh boy. Here well, we that's, go. that's when you're happier in your away jerseys rather than your home jerseys. <laughs> exactly. Um, but, but I think that was, that was a really big fact. Not, not just because Jerome was, uh, coming off of a really strong game, but it was another guy that maybe could come in and make shots and help you space the floor. And I thought it was magnified a bit because Demisi didn't play particularly well. He rebounded all right when he got in, um, but took some questionable shots, uh, struggled a bit on on defense I, I felt like and um just really didn't seem in the flow of the game just was you know, struggled with movement offensively kind of moved into somebody but wasn't really setting a screen just kind of got in the way a couple times in the first half um just really put IU in a difficult spot between the foul trouble to in the first half Justin Smith had two um uh uh, Brunk had two and Davis had two. They managed to get through uh, playing playing Joey and Duran a little bit without picking up a third, but um, just were not a lot of places to turn. And I think the the loss of those two guys, you know, some of those toughness plays are ones that Race could make or coming up with a loose ball uh, that that you know may lead to a offensive rebound for Penn State, but he may track it down and get it back for IU. And you've got um, you know Jerome again being a guy who can score and maybe be a, a, a bit more versatile on that end. And, and really anybody who couldn't have done anything offensively would have been a, a welcome sight tonight. So be remiss oh. if we didn't say that th- those guys being gone w- weren't a factor, wasn't the deciding factor in the game, but certainly uh, exaggerated some of the things that weren't going well for IU. What what have we done to the basketball gods that in, in the last two years, you know, Race Thompson played one of his better halves against Michigan State and then gets undercut and has to sit out two games. Jerome Hunter has a breakout game with, with shooting and defense and was just fantastic, and then he comes down with the flu in the next game. I mean, uh, I'm not an excuse guy. You, you, we got beat by the guys that wearing Indiana jerseys that were on the floor. This is my team from the movie Hoosiers. I know I get all that. But, man, what have we done to deserve, after 20 years of not being relevant, uh, to having at least two part-time players playing a role and not having them available for a very tough road game. Uh, well, it's, it's just frustrating as a fan. It's not only a, a tough road game, but a, a game that now we look at uh, playing Mr. Hindsight and what were we lacking, baskets going, ball going in the basket, and that's what Jerome can bring and has showed that he could bring last game. And we also let, lost uh, or were lacking toughness. And, and what does race bring but toughness? So that's where it gets frustrating, like you said. Yep. Jed, you you get host of the week, man. You you've been spot on. <laughs> Any, I go uh, off on these rants. I'm just going to say, Chad, speak. <laughs> <laughs> it's good stuff, man. Seriously. Um. So I don't know if it, any other meaningful moments for you guys. Um. You may want to just prolong it so that we don't have to go over the statistics. So if you've got any, now would be the time to uh to fire them off. But well, I just wanted to bring up because uh, guys are chatting about. Uh, I mean, we've we've said about the foul calling and everything. It did look a little awkward where we, we you breathed on Lamar and, and he and you suddenly we got called for a foul and Archie kind of towed the line. I think his, his a quote from him from the in the post game is no idea why we're not getting to the free throw line. So that's about as as close as a coach can uh, toe the line to saying the, the officiating was was questionable uh, without getting calls from the from the head office. Uh, for a fine or something. And, and it, and it did seem to kind of take, 
uh, get in the guys' heads tonight and, and, and does get frustrating. And you see those, and then you see random balls, uh, Justin Smith passing it to uh, Al Durham, and suddenly it makes a 72-degree turn to the, to the right. Um, and then I don't know. I don't think anyone really knows. Did you guys see or could you figure out why Archie got that technical? It felt like, I, well, my only guess is, I mean, I don't know what he said. He seemed to be incredulous that it was something he said, but I think it was a case where Al drove into somebody a little bit, got his hands all over him, Al backed out, and I think it was somewhat of a culmination of some of those other foul calls, but I don't know what he... It's I mean, probably Coach Roberts. I, yeah, it didn't look like, I mean, I, they, they didn't get close enough to really tell. I mean, Archie was clearly still standing next to him, and he turned around, but I, yeah, I don't know. Um, all right, so let's let's take a, a quick look at stats, which will be uh, wildly depressing. Um, you know, one of the things though, just just to just to touch on this, I wrote down a couple things even coming into the game, just statistical things that that may or may not decide the game. And so you had uh, coming into the game, Penn State was 13th in in league play and defensive efficiency. Uh, a decent amount of that was they got lit up by Ohio State in their first matchup back when Ohio State was playing well. Um, but but still, we're 13th there, uh, 13th in defensive rebounding, and 14th in free throw rate. However, on the flip side, they were third in turnover percentage. They might be first uh, after tonight, but they were first in steal percentage. They'll definitely retain that after tonight. Uh, and, and those, to me, were, from a rebounding standpoint, IU did a, a relatively good job, um, but gave up. You know, Penn State rebounded from percentage-wise. Um, they were they got a each team got eleven offensive rebounds. There were uh, more rebounds to be had uh, when Penn State shot because IU turned it over so much. But from a you know percentage standpoint, IU didn't really take advantage of that all that much. Um, actually, got outscored on second chance points, so didn't take advantage of that. Only got to the free throw line ten times over the course of the game. Did make nine of them. So I think I saw somebody on Twitter joke that this is the game that IU would shoot ninety percent from the line when they only get there ten times. But you know from a free throw rate perspective, that's well, well, well below. Uh, what Penn State was giving up. And then the turnovers, as we mentioned, 18 turnovers for IU. Uh, I have not looked yet what the percentage on that is, but it can't be good. 25.7. Uh, it, it looks like on the box score that I'm looking at, IU was, this is 7 of 20 on layups. My God. Um, so it just, you know, the turnovers, Penn State turned so many into points. There were so many live ball turnovers with all the steals. They had 15 steals. And as I mentioned before, 21 points off of turnovers. I mean, that was just a, you know those differences. IU was un- unable to take advantage of the areas that Penn State had struggled coming into the game, uh, and were exposed by the areas that that Penn State had excelled statistically coming into the game. And uh, y- you really don't need to look uh, a whole lot further into it than that. Uh, Coach did mention uh, some of the shooting numbers from the guards. Uh, IU's guards overall were three for twenty six, if I'm reading this correctly. Um, Al was one of seven. Rob was zero for six. Armand was zero for three, and Devante was two for ten. Um, and everybody that played for IU got a turnover, so that was uh, relatively equally distributed. Um, any other uh, statistical things jump out at you, Coach? Well, you can't win basketball games shooting thirty three point three percent from the field. Um, whether that was shot selection, execution, play calling, whoever's responsible for that, that's just a bad game. And then you couple that with 18 uh, points that lead to, you know, uh, 21 points off of turnovers. Th- those are just stats that say you played bad. Uh, and, and it's obvious. And it's just frustrating when you hold a team, I think it was points per possession, 9.938 or something like that, um, well below one. And you only give up 64 in a game and you get beat by 15. It, it just smacks of the Rutgers effort again. And, and um, in, in the whole, uh, Indiana has played pretty solid defense back since uh, that Maryland debacle. Um, and, and you lost 59 50 to Rutgers and 64 49. So the defense is, is traveling right now on the road. And this, and what Archie and staff and players have to dig down and deep is find out how to play offense on the road. Cause they're playing offense. Okay. At home, but the, the shooting percentage and the lack of getting to the foul line and the turnover is just not, not conducive to good play. Yeah. Chad, any, any numbers uh, from this that, that you, that we didn't beat into the ground already that uh, jump out to you? No, no. I mean, I don't think there's anything else other to beat the ground. Just, just to inverse the, the, the best numbers we've seen with uh, 22 uh, assists to, to six turnovers and completely flip that. Uh, it's, it's just kind of the tail right there. 
That, yeah. That's the frustrating part is is how on Sunday um, it could be so efficient. Uh, and, and I know Maryland's probably not the greatest team defensively, um, but and you go up against a team that averages a lot of steals or gets a lot of steals, so it happened tonight. Um, so, so there's part of the part of the explanation. But that's what's so frustrating is when you think you've turned the corner, and then you just go back to the depths that that you you were you were at three or four weeks ago. But let's just hope it's a blip and you, and you can get back to to doing some things a little bit better uh, uh, against Ohio State. Yeah, it's it's pretty hard to figure out what to uh, expect from this team too much at this point. But yeah, it, it's another game, coach. Like you said, against Rutgers. I mean, you hold a a solid offensive team in in Penn State to less than a point per possession. I think, as you said, the one I'm looking at has it at point nine three and and sixty four points. You should, I mean, you shouldn't be losing by double digits at least. But your defense is putting you in a position to win, and I think that has. Um, really been an area that IU has gotten substantially better at and played really well at recently. Um, but these offensive walls just continue to to bite this team. Uh, and, and I guess it's as good a time as any. We'll, we'll kind of wrap up this segment, touching a little bit on the the guard play again to, to circle back to it. You know, Al and Rob uh, started in the backcourt. They were a combined one of thirteen from the floor. Uh, ended up with just five points between them. Those all came from Al. He hit a three. Uh, early in the game, I think might have been the first or second basket that IU got. Um, so you had that uh, five assists between them. Rob did lead with the team with four assists, but four turnovers uh, be- between those guys. I, you know, the fantasy one it, it continues to be difficult because there's just he missed some shots close to the basket. I thought he at times was aggressive driving to the paint, and at times was really unaggressive driving. You know, more going east and west uh, than the other way around. I, I'm just struggling to really get a read on what his capabilities are and what the root of his struggles have have really become. So, Coach, I'm going to throw you the potentially unanswerable question um, with, with him. But but what are you seeing? Is this a case where, again, you, you, they don't have a lot of guards? I'm not clamoring to see uh, more of, of Devontae at this point. But do you think it's something physically that – is it worth sitting him at some point? He just – he just still doesn't quite look like himself, even though he shows flashes of it. Yes, I I, I think I agree with you. Um, Rob Finnessy, I mean, Trace Jackson Davis is our best player. Brunk is our best energy guy, but but Rob is the glue that makes this team go. Uh, and we've played better basketball. Indiana's played better basketball since Rob's been inserted into the starting lineup and gotten, uh, you know, 24 to 30 minutes but it's also obvious Andy that he can't go um that long I think he laid it on the line against Michigan State in guarding um oh my Cassius Winston Uh, I thought he had a really good battle with Cowan and then he he took a little bump at the end of the game and everyone was wondering and and he just was not himself and so when you have your energy guy having to sit because of foul trouble and just struggles and brunk, and you have your glue guy, point guard, who guards and runs offense, he still got four assists tonight. You're taking two of your three best players overall uh, out of the game, and then you just got to rely on other players. So I, I think that's why you see uh, him being subbed out at times when we wouldn't want him to be subbed out, uh, because I think there's probably a minutes uh, type of situation or they're really watching him for fatigue at some point. Um, he got subbed out early in the second half, and I thought that, that was to Indiana's demise. Um, at, I think it was before the first media timeout of the second half, and um, that's when Devontae struggled and the game started to get out of hand. And so, again, there, you know, if it's by choice – then yeah, I'd be critical of Coach Miller for subbing out fantasy just by choice in that situation for Green. If it's health reasons and fatigue, and you're not just getting stuff out of fantasy, and you need to sit him for a little bit, then you know, yeah, I agree. Maybe you go to Franklin there, but you need you need someone. And and Devontae's just coming off a good game. I can understand where a coach would probably go there at that 17 minute mark. But yeah, fantasy needs to play well. If he doesn't, um, the team's going to struggle. Well, and I think I think that's uh, it, it's tough because we haven't seen that ideal version of of fantasy for for long stretches. Like we got glimpses of it last year, and and that hurts. But I do see myself in these games, even though we're not getting the the perfect version of him um, uh, when the team is down or struggling. Um, I'm looking at who's in there and Rob's not in there and I'm immediately begging for him to get into this game and try to settle down this team. 
Um, I think maybe some of the struggles as well for him is uh, he may feel a little bit more load on his on his shoulders because he doesn't necessarily have that scoring threat to guard there next to him that he can relax and, and, and play off of. I believe uh, he's got to have that kind of person uh, for him to be really strong, someone he knows he can dish it to and get a basket for him so he doesn't have to worry himself to go get that basket if he's not able to get it into the post. Um, but uh, we still do, uh, whether it's conditioning, health, like, like Coach said, uh, we need him out there for as many minutes as he can health, healthily give us. And and I'm a big Rob Finnessy fan, coached against him. Um, I think he needs to be tougher, too. And, and what you said there, too, is I think if he's feeling pressure that he has the whole weight of the team running his shoulders, he just needs to go out and do what Rob Finnessy does and then and, and let it go. But I think sometimes he's trying too hard, uh, and, and that's a, a little bit of a lack of toughness. You just got to be who you are and, and play. And it just seems like he gets caught in positions, um, tries too hard to throw a bounce pass in traffic and bounces it off a foot. And he just needs to settle down and be Rob Finnessy uh, instead of Superman or whatever he might be trying to do. And I, that's just a guess. I, I'm not down there. I don't know the young man. But, yeah, um, we're not seeing 100% Rob Finnessy. And even at that, he's probably – he is our best guard. And the options are very limited at, at, at running the team um, and decision-making beyond Rob. Yep. All right, well – Coming up on the assembly call, we'll hand out our game balls and hit any other lingering storylines, and we'll look ahead briefly to IU's next opponent, and then it'll be time for last call. That's all next here on the assembly call. Stick with us. Zizloft, I never miss an open three, and I never miss an episode of The Assembly Call. You're listening to The Assembly Call IU postgame show. Catch us live immediately following every IU basketball game, plus every Thursday night at our website, assemblycall.com. And while you're there, make sure you sign up for our free IU Hoops email newsletter. Over 7,000 of your fellow IU fans have already subscribed. You can also text IU to 66866 to subscribe to the newsletter. That's IU to 66866. I'm Andy Bottoms here with Coach Brian Tonsoni and Chat Mob Chad Schwartzkoff, and we are breaking down IU's disappointing 64-49 to loss in Happy Valley. And now it's time for game balls. I know, guys, we have, I believe it was the Wisconsin game where uh, opted not to give a game ball to anyone, uh, but I don't know that that is uh, fair tonight. So I'll kind of first I'll, I'll throw that quickly to you guys whether you think we uh, we do one or we don't. Uh, I think there's a couple options to be honest, and and we all need to be a little more positive. Uh, one of the things that uh, drew me to assembly call to start out was the fact that there was honest evaluation with the with the tinge of optimism, even on, on tough nights. And, and I think we've all been struggling for many, many years. And, and that's just one of the things I think that I, that I'm a proud member of, of this organization is that, yeah, we're frustrated, uh, but we, but we always need to find the positive. So I, I vote for us to, to give a game ball uh, to make sure we're all a little bit positive heading into the Ohio state game. Well, I usually lean on Jared for positivity and he's not here, but it would be hard. I would be hard pressed to go against that impassioned, plea to uh to continue with it and give some positivity so uh i say we go with it and with that coach since you you did say you had a couple options i'll even throw it to you first to uh, hand yours out so you know if i'm gonna walk the walk i'm gonna uh, whatever that saying is i'm bad with saying <laughs> talk to talk because i better walk the walk or whatever that is i have not been a fan of deron davis for many years i'm gonna give the game ball to deron davis I thought he kept Indiana in the game in the first half with his 10 minutes of play. He had seven more minutes in the second half. He struggled to score around the rim only at two for seven, but he had five rebounds. Um, I thought he guarded really well, had six points. And without Deron Davis, this game would have been out of hand earlier. And again, looking forward, we are 15-6, and six, which is really good for this squad, I think, um, and, and trying to be positive about things on, t- on a game like tonight or or a night like this, I, I'm just really happy for Duran as a person, 
uh, to weather the criticism from all of us and to stick with this. And then maybe that bodes well for the future, even when we get Race Thompson back, that we have added post depth to handle tough situations like brunk and foul trouble and so forth. So congratulations, Duran. Um, glad you had a night. Let's keep it going and uh, let's try not to get the flu uh, for, by Saturday. <laughs> exactly. All right, Chad, what about you? Um, yeah, I'm going to hop on with coach as well. Um, you gave an impassionate thing there about Duran. Uh, he's a guy that struggled that coming into this season, we were expecting great things from him and, and hoping him to rebound, come back from his injury and, and play really well. And he's had some unfortunate, uh, uh, fouls called him at the beginning of a lot of games this year. Uh, but he came in and gave some great moments, uh, a great play. I even remember in the first half when he uh, got the ball underneath and, uh, got good position underneath his, his player and uh, caused Lamar to come over against him. Did a great shot fake to get him up in the air, and then uh, dished a beautiful pass for uh, an easy layup for Trace Jackson. And then also just for that that beautiful uh, outside game, he has his, his mid-range game that evidently he found in this uh, in this game. Uh, yeah, I'll give it to Duran as well. Blossoming mid-range game, I would say. Um, there you go. Yeah, I, I, I mean, he'll, he'll get it because... Um, it's a, a democracy here, and, and that's where it is. And I think, uh, and I think there's one that, other big person we can give it to. Yeah, so I, I'll talk a little bit about Trace, but I will say about Duran, um, it is it is both exciting and disappointing to watch some of this with him because you look at a guy who you know there's the one great spin move that he had. He just couldn't finish. You just see a guy who's been kind of robbed of of so much of the athleticism that he had coming in, and, and that part is is sad to see. But he is a guy who. Uh, I, I think really appreciates being uh, an, an IU player. And maybe I'm reading too much into this, but when we went to the Arkansas game, you know, we went down on the floor after the game, and, and sometimes the players will come out and do that. He was the only guy that went out there. He wasn't out there for long, uh, and he didn't play in that game. I don't think he, I don't think he played a minute in it, to be honest. Which, given the way that Arkansas plays, probably isn't super surprising. But you know, he was out trying to talk to people and, and do whatever. So uh, that was a moment with him that that I appreciated. Uh, but I'll talk a little bit about Trace. I mean, he made a play. One of the other things I had for a potential meaningful moment, which uh, might have been, would have maybe been better had the had IU actually won. But it was one of the very first plays of the game, and he missed a shot by the basket. Other guy got the ball, but he didn't give up on the play and ended up tying him up. Um, and IU got the uh, ended up getting the arrow. Don't know if they scored uh, at that point, but just a you know kind of hustle hustle play a toughness type play uh that he made and, and overall over the course of the game he had 14.7 rebounds uh led iu in both those categories justin smith also had seven rebounds um did have a couple turnovers uh, managed to stay out of foul trouble he, he got taken out a little bit in the beginning there was a, a a call where allegedly he hit lamar stevens on the arm on a jump shot and and then it was one of those where it was within the first couple of minutes picked up a foul and trying to make sure that he didn't get another one and would end up sitting on the bench. He ended up uh, just with two fouls for the game. But I thought a another solid game from him um, continues to to not back down from some of the challenges that the physicality of the uh, of the Big Ten will bring. So uh, a solid game from him. But Deron Davis, the winner of tonight's game ball, which I am relatively certain is his uh, his first. So he joins uh, Jerome and Armand. Uh, with uh, with one game ball, I think he's the maybe the eighth player on the team to uh, to win one so far this season. So, uh, congrats to him again—a solid performance off the bench uh, and one that was uh, that was pretty good and and hopefully a good sign of things to come. He's strung together a couple good performances uh, in a row. In terms of other storylines that we haven't hit, I don't know that there's a ton. We haven't touched a, a whole lot on Justin Smith, which I suppose uh, we probably ought to. He ended up with 13.7 rebounds, uh, 6 of 8 shooting, um, did have 4 fouls, 3 turnovers uh, with him. I, I know, Coach, you alluded to him a little bit earlier. I thought it was uh, an up-and-down game from him. I thought some of the turnovers were uh, fell into that more casual nature. I thought at times he... He did an okay job defending Lamar Stevens, um, and that was a guy he had defended well uh, a year ago. But then I felt as the game went on, he really either wore down or you know fell into the same trap that a number of the other guys on the team did. But uh, I guess assess his his overall performance in your eyes tonight. I, I think he had an average performance. Uh, you know, I, Justin Smith is just an interesting player. Um, He's he he guards well. He he can score. He can rebound. I think he's been a little more consistent this year, and and still 
he struggles with that casual play, and it hurts on some offensive decision making. I think it hurts in some shot selection. Although the one bad shot he took today, he drained a three. Um, so um, there, there's that. Uh, and I do think uh, you know Stevens is a great player, and Stevens is going to get hot. So we we all need to be careful. I felt the same way as you said. He, I thought he got worn down or or kind of didn't guard as hard in the last seven, eight minutes, and Stevens was able to just get going. Um, I, I, I'm afraid I, I don't want to fall into an easy take on that because um, the Stevens is that good, it, and and so he's tough to guard. But it sure looked like that, and there's some times where he's casual and misses his cutters. So, But what I've learned about Justin Smith and come to appreciate about Justin Smith is that he his ups and downs aren't game to game. They're kind of within minute stretches, and at least that's a somewhat acceptable. Not, I don't really like it, to be honest with you, but it's somewhat acceptable when he, he doesn't have a full game anymore that I think is just really out to lunch. It, it's just smaller segments and – Sometimes it's key segments, but, um, you know, we, we'd be lost without Justin, to be honest uh, with you, because uh, he does so much. I think I think he's a player that, I mean, I, we talked about earlier, I talked about earlier in the season that he's one that you have to get involved early in the offense. And, and games where he scored the points uh, early on, or, or been even the first possession, uh, is when he's had his best nights. And he hasn't had that kind of look or go-to uh, uh, as of recent. Um, he he missed some opportunities. I believe the team overall missed some opportunities crashing the board tonight. And he did what he could against Lamar. Um, I, I felt like I even made a note early on that we needed to switch uh, Justin Smith on him because I thought that Lamar was a little bit too fast for Trace Jackson. But then it, it seemed like he was maybe a little too uh, big for Justin at some points. So I don't know if Lamar put in put on some extra pounds in the offseason season. But he, he was able to bully Justin uh, a little more than we've seen um, all year long. But, um, yeah, Coach, fantastic point there. With uh, I haven't really felt this year like we've had uh, bad Justin or, or frustrating Justin, the Justin that you just want to shake. Uh, we've just kind of had mediocre Justin or uh, uh, excellent Justin. Yeah, he I, he does just kind of ebb and flow over the course of the game, and I think we've we've talked about that on some other shows where Archie he's a guy that Archie is is willing to stick with because for the most part he, he knows that a, a potential turnaround is coming from him, and, and I agree with with you on Stevens. I, I think there's times when when he settles for his outside shot a little bit too much, and he doesn't particularly shoot it well from three, but he can be relentless attacking the basket, and he's got the body that. Um, he can absorb the contact, but if if referees are are given foul calls, he's a guy who can get to the line a lot. And I thought he shot uncharacteristically poorly from the free throw line tonight. Um, so I, I guess we'll see. But uh, so quick, you know, quick look ahead uh, for IU uh, and for us. So tomorrow night, uh, Thursday night, uh, we'll have assembly call radio. Jared and Ryan will be on. Uh, they'll give their thoughts on this game. Um. Yeah, with uh, with a little time to digest what happened and, and process the emotions and feelings of that. And then IU goes to Ohio State on Saturday. Uh, Jared has uh, Mark Titus lined up to be on the postgame show. Uh, I will not be on. I'll be uh, coaching a game right around that same time. And then we've got the live IU Purdue postgame show at Switchyard on February 8th when we're all in town. I'm really looking forward uh, to that trip. Uh, always good to get back again to Bloomington from an Ohio state perspective, they did pick up a win on Sunday night uh, at Northwestern ended up winning by 12. It was pretty close throughout uh, heading into that game. They had lost six or they had lost uh, yeah, less lost six of their previous seven games. I guess it is uh, with the only win coming at home against Nebraska. So really since beating Kentucky on December 21st, Ohio state is two and six with the only wins coming against the, the lowest two teams in the big 10. So uh, you don't really know too much what to expect. Uh, it could be a case where they start to figure some things out, get a little confidence by uh, getting back in the in the win column, and, uh, and we'll see what happens. Kyle Young's gotten back into the mix uh, for them after being out. I know he came back in the first IU game, so uh, so he'll be back. And it, it you know any road game for this IU team is going to be a tough one at this point. If you look at um, 
at the road games in the Big Ten. They lost at Wisconsin by 20, lost at Maryland by 16, but it really was was more than that. Lost at Rutgers by 9, did win at Nebraska, and then lost tonight at Penn State by 15. So the vast majority of those road games for IU have not been competitive, um, and I think that's where you, you kind of take a wait-and-see approach. We've seen this team bounce back within the season, uh, come back and, and play well in games after disappointing performances. It, it's just one, though, that when you look down the schedule, it's really hard to, to look at the way this team has played on the road for forty min- in, in over the course of a 40-minute basketball game and say they, this is one that they're going to be able to go out and get. doesn't mean that they can't get any of those games because there have been stretches of each of those games that have really been in it, and then they, they go into a lull and, uh, and really struggle. So to me, I guess that's the biggest lingering question of anything is – is who, if anybody, can this team beat on the road? Uh, and the answer so far uh, has been pretty hard to come by. And uh, so that game against Ohio State will be difficult. They've had a week to prepare. They haven't. They won't have played since that Sunday. I know Archie alluded to that after one of the games where both Penn State and Ohio State had gotten the better part of a week to prepare for IU. Not sure how much of a factor that really was in tonight's game necessarily, but uh, that at least is is out there. So. Um, with that, we'll uh, we'll kind of close up here. Uh, you're listening to the Assembly Call IU Post Game Show, and remember that because you're an Assembly Call listener, you get 20% off of your entire order at homefieldapparel.com with the promo code Assembly20. So if you want a great deal on the most comfortable and unique IU apparel that you'll find anywhere, go to homefieldapparel.com and use the promo code Assembly20 for 20% off your entire order. All right, guys, it's time for last call. We'll get our final thoughts on IU's loss to Penn State by a final score of 64 to 49. Uh, Chad, coach was heaping praise on you earlier, so uh, that is enough for me to let you go first with your last call. That is not to put pressure on you. That is really a reward uh, for uh, coach's praise of you. So he's 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 good at grading. He's, he's an educator, as he said, and uh, I think your grade for tonight is, is solid so far. So consider this potentially the final exam. No pressure on you, but uh, we'll have coach grade you after you're done with this. No, nah, it's just the closing thoughts. It's it's the little paragraph that you just kind of put in there to make sure your professor's still reading your paper and right before you cite all your stuff. Now, I mean, it's it, it's it's one that you hope the team puts puts aside and, and moves on from it. Look at the stuff you you didn't you didn't do right. Uh, again, Big Ten is tough on the road. All that. Uh, it's just it, it's frustrating to to know that this team has a floor like we have, but we have a ceiling like we have. And you never know what's going to show up from night to night. And you hope that uh, uh, you, you get the better side. Uh, maybe we're due for that better side. Um, I guess uh, we'll see coming up. Uh, Ohio State's going to be out for blood because uh, we beat them. Now they want to beat us at home and they, they want to win. But they're having similar struggles that we are. So um, I'm feeling fairly confident um, going into it. And uh, I'll be there to cheer no matter what. All right. Thanks. And uh, Chad, we appreciate you hopping on uh, to do the show tonight. You'll also be doing some of the uh, some of the heavy lifting after the Purdue game as well. So we appreciate you helping out with that at all. And uh, did an excellent job, as Coach said, all kidding aside, uh, did a great job. So, Coach, uh, final thoughts from you on tonight's loss. Yeah, it's frustrating to lose, and and it's right to be frustrated. Um, but this team is an inconsistent team. It was in the summer. It was in November. It still is today. Um, wherever you want to put the, the blame for that, um, it is an inconsistent roster. It, it just is. And, um, I, I Chad, the, the ceiling and the floor and all of that stuff was, was again, a great comment because that's what it is. This team can play bad and this team can play really, really well. And, and it is Indiana and it's, uh, and it's 15 and six. So, uh, to some extent, I think this team is overachieving. Uh, because I think that there are some flaws that are really hard to overcome, and we saw a lot of them tonight. Uh, If the post uh, play is not uh, there and and the guard play is not there, then there's not much to this team. And when it is, it's very competitive. So uh, it's up to the coaches to get better and work better. It's up to the players to uh, try to find out why they they cannot bring the same intensity uh, when they travel, Uh, or it'll be another tough one on Saturday. And then uh, hopefully we're home for two more games and can can get back to comfortable spots. But stay stay with this uh, program, stay with the team. Uh, be frustrated, uh, but there's going to be a few more losses though this year. Uh, let's hope there's more wins. 
Thanks, Coach. Uh, for me, I think I've kind of taken to looking at the season a week at a time, basically, and trying to figure out what what would be a good result for this week. And I think you came out of the Maryland game disappointed, certainly, but looking ahead to a couple road games, and, and I think anybody would feel good if they said, can this team get one of these two on the road? So uh, an opportunity to get that out of the way w- was lost by the way that the team came out in the second half, um, but the potential to you know, end the week one and one is still there going into Ohio State, a team that, that doesn't have a ton of confidence. Really, as I said, uh, watch a decent amount of that Northwestern game. Didn't play well for long stretches of that game. Uh, we're all obviously familiar with a team that did not play well for long stretches of a game against Northwestern as well. So it's a familiar feeling, I guess, for everybody. But it, it is not uh, the the kind of game that you would have looked at when Ohio State really had it rolling in mid-December and said this is not a game this team cannot win. Uh, and, and one of the comments Archie made after the game against Maryland was they played well enough to win. They play, also played well enough to lose. I think that speaks to some of the floor and ceiling comments that uh, that Chad made, that this team at its best can be competitive and can win just about any game that's left on the schedule at this point. And at its worst or with long stretches of its worst, as we saw tonight, it can it can lose to anybody and can lose to anybody handily. Um, the, the good news from a bracketology perspective is that every game from here on out represents a chance to get a quality win and uh, not necessarily take on a bad loss. You certainly can't turn around and lose all those games because then uh, the volume of losses accumulates and that really starts to matter. So it it really does become a question of how this team can bounce back and try to figure out ways to to elongate the stretches of good play and shorten the stretches of poor play. And, and that starts with the guards. It is uh, certainly cliche to talk about how important backcourt play is in college basketball or really any level of basketball, but um, no team, this one or any other, is going to be able to win road games against quality opponents with the, the accumulation of stats that the backcourt had tonight. Doesn't mean that the post players were blameless for the way that this game played out, um, but this team has to get its identity back, if you will, if that identity is driving to the basket, trying to get fouled, getting the ball inside. Uh, they really deviated from that tonight in the second half, and the result was was really poor. Um, so you you flip back and you watch these last two games and say there was one game where they hardly turned the ball over at all and, and one game where they were giving it away all over the place. And so uh, if you look at those two and can tell me which team's going to show up in Columbus on Saturday, you're a heck of a lot smarter than I am. So uh, we, we kind of sit back and wait and try to figure out how this team's going to respond. Uh, I'm optimistic that they can bounce back, that they can play uh, in a close game and, and maybe pull one of these out, get to that one in one week that I think everybody would be happy with and uh, move on from there for a, you know some some home games, as Coach said, where uh, hopefully they can keep keep stacking wins from there. So certainly a disappointing game, as we talked about. Uh, team did some some things really well in the first half, really struggled in the second half, and, uh, and now it's up to them to see uh, how they can bounce back and, and get some confidence away from home because the road games certainly don't get easier. Uh, I think Minnesota and Michigan are the next two up after uh, Ohio State, so neither are places where IU has uh, had a great deal of success lately, and both those are teams that have struggled at times really fighting uh, to get in the tournament as well, so will not be easy to win there, and this team's got to figure out a way to maintain the toughness that it needs away from Assembly Hall uh, to be able to get some of these wins and uh and uh, right the ship a little bit after a game like this. So that will do it for us tonight on this edition of the Assembly Call. Uh, we will, as soon as I can actually find the outro, there it is. Um, I'm having a bad second half as well. It happens to the best of us. Uh, so if you want to see us do the show live and be part of the live chat, make sure that you subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash assembly call. And, and don't forget to go to assemblycall.com or text IU to 66866 to join our free email newsletter. Special thanks to longtime listener Bob Thompson, who produced much of the music you hear on the show. And thank you for listening. We'll be back to talk IU Hoops with you again on Thursday night. Until then, keep your elbows in and your eyes on the rim, and go Hoosiers. Thank everybody for coming out. All right, I got to get out of here, folks. Thank you.